A group of modern-day Ronin is formed to steal a briefcase. You don't want to go in there. Get out of here. Walk away. Walk away. Let's go! How did you know it was an ambush? That's the first thing they teach you. Who taught you? I don't remember. That's the second thing they teach you. Ronan has a plot in service of action and tension. Natasha... Oh my god, how the fuck do you pronounce her name? Natasha McElhone... McElhone's... <laughs> Natasha McElhone's Deirdre assembles a team of mercenaries from around the world, consisting of Robert De Niro's Sam, Jean Reno's Vincent, Stellan Skarsgård's Gregor, Sean Bean's Spence, and Skip Sutter's Larry. The plot is quite simple, despite the film's attempts to make it appear more complicated. Ronan boils down to a MacGuffin hunt. This isn't a bad thing, as John Frankenheimer's direction keeps things tense and grounded, and there is some really interesting character work being portrayed by the talented cast. Where the character work falters is in some of the interpersonal dynamics between characters. The main selling point of Ronan is the action, more specifically the car chases, which have stood the test of time and are often regarded amongst the best chase sequences ever shot. Ronan has two massive car chases, lasting for several minutes each. The first is incredible spectacle, and the culmination of all the methodical prep work we've watched the team conducting up until that point. The second chase manages to top the first in truly impressive fashion. The chases are full of excellent stunt work, precision driving, spectacular crashes, great use of real locations, and the top it all off are wonderfully shot. Clean and clear. The chase scenes have a heavy sense of realism to them. There are moments in the final car chase that truly feel like accidents, but they completely match continuity and fit within the flow of the scene. So whether these moments are pre-planned or incorporated accidents, they don't distract from the intensity and immersion of the sequence. The only time green screen was used in the film is not during one of the chase scenes, it's actually just during a conversation between Sam and Vincent after one of the gunfights. The green screen does not look good in this scene, and thankfully they never use it for the chase scenes. When you see De Niro behind the wheel, it is really him, and he is really there. They used a fairly common type of stunt vehicle called a right-hand drive car, where the stunt driver is controlling the vehicle from the passenger seat, and the actor is matching their movements on a fake steering console. I'm sure De Niro wouldn't have been making such goofy faces if he were on a green screen the whole time, but it only adds to the scene's intensity and sense of danger. You can see fear in De Niro's eyes, real fear. Director John Frankenheimer's experience as a race car driver, his dedication to realism, and his decision to refrain from digital effects, which were on the rise during the time this movie was made, make the car chases and run in some of the best in action cinema. Special credit needs to be paid to stunt coordinator Jean-Claude Lanyez. There is some poor sound design amidst considerably better sound editing. Especially distracting are the cheesy stock sound effects for doors opening. Every time a door opened, but that admittedly might not be as big of a distraction depending on who you are. The sound design for the action is mostly good aside from that cheesy silenced gunshot sounds, a little pew pew. But overall, if the sound design had been pushed a bit further, then some of the street level gunplay could have been reminiscent of Michael Mann's heat. The shootouts don't fare as well as the car chases, but are still engaging. The most exciting moment of action outside of the car chases was actually an accident left in the film where two stuntmen flip over a railing and crash onto the cement below. Now, not everything works 100%. De Niro's character Sam is thoroughly established as extremely careful. He plans meticulously, gathers as much information ahead of time as he can, and doesn't put himself into a situation that he doesn't have a way out of. This is a cool trait, and is in fact his defining characteristic, and De Niro plays the role to perfection. The problem is that there are a few moments that run contrary to his extremely careful nature. Small example being in the opening scene where De Niro hides a gun behind some crates outside the bar before entering and meeting his new associates. Hiding a firearm just in case perfectly fits his character, but the way he hides it goes against his nature in two small but distracting ways. First, he draws the firearm before moving the crates, and second, he holds it in his outside hand facing the street as opposed to his hand facing the wall. Now, usually something this small would be negligible, but this type of thing really stood out to me since Ronan made realism and meticulous details a priority throughout most of the film. Another moment that seems to go against Sam's nature is the intel gathering scene at the hotel. The idea for this scene perfectly reinforces this careful characteristic. It involves him and Deirdre posing as husband and wife and having their photo taken with their targets in the background. Could you take a picture of me and my wife? Get the background. 
My issue with the scene is that it involves a variable that I don't believe the character would leave unaccounted for. In order to have their photos taken, Sim asks a stranger to take the photos, which opens up a whole world of potential problems. And there's no reason why the one taking the photos couldn't be another member of their team. Vincent could have easily been planted in the hotel lobby for them to pretend to ask for their photo being taken, minimizing the level of risk and mistake. There's some other issues too. I don't particularly buy the romance angle of the film. Deirdre and Sam don't really have any chemistry or much in the way of meaningful exchanges, and the romance feels like it's happening just because the plot calls for it. I think the creative team was at least somewhat aware of this as the film's unused alternate ending pushed the romance angle a bit harder. The reveals that transpire on a character level are a bit too transparent. Without getting too spoilery, there's a member on the team who turns out to be a double-crossing bad guy. This is far too telegraphed for it to be surprising, but the movie wants it to be surprising. You can tell from his very first shot that he's going to end up a villain. The predictability in the characters extends into the plot a bit as well, which is a problem for a film that is meant to be full of twists and turns. The script isn't great. Much of what works well in the film comes down to direction and execution. The middling plot is a bit surprising given that David Mamet is one of the film's two writers, though he is credited under the pseudonym Richard Weiss, which is a bit telling. Ronan looks to be his only screenwriting credit under a pseudonym. The film's other writer, J.D. Zeick, has the sole story credit, and if I had to guess, most of Mamet's influence is probably on the dialogue, which is in fact quite good, and probably some of the more nuanced character moments. The script overall does have its moments, though, like a pretty great scene where De Niro ambushes Sean Bean with a coffee cup. I don't like your attitude. It's the color of the boat hat. Well, fuck off! Oh, you got the gun. I'm on arm. Do something. Go ahead. Do something. Do something. Do something. Do something. Tell me about an ambush. Tell me about an ambush. I ambushed you with a cup of coffee. So that's Ronan. Come for the jaw-dropping chases, stay for the decent action thriller confines. If you haven't seen Ronan, check it out. Make sure you subscribe to the channel, check out more of the content we have here. It's more than just reviews, it's also original short films, video essays, all kinds of stuff. So subscribe, stick around, and I'll see you in the next video.